we have tweeted out this week's version. Thank you very much. Very informative. Okay, so I was driving my team crazy the, the other day um, because they kept saying, when are you going to give us your presentation for your keynote? When are you going to like give us your presentation? And I said, well, I don't know what I'm speaking about yet. <laughs> That's why there's no title underneath my keynote. Um, anyways, um, so I decided that I was going to just wing it. And um, it drives my husband crazy when I wing it. Um, but uh, actually, I think, what'd you say? Oh, yeah, it probably drives Molly crazy when I wing it, too. Oh, that's number 11, wing it. <laughs> um, so anyways, I actually um, have been extremely fortunate about um, in my career in the last whatever years it has been. And um, I always talk about sometimes with folks like the lessons I've learned along the way. And um, I'm a big believer that uh, everything has a lesson in it, everything. And um, in fact, um, a couple years ago, I was, doing the, um, I was doing a eulogy at my grandmother's funeral. And my grandmother belonged to Meg's Georgia First Baptist Church. And I'm telling you, you could probably fit the entire church just where we're sitting here in this conference room. It's just a white building in Meg's, Georgia. And if you don't know where Meg's, Georgia is, well, most people don't. It's just in the middle of a pecan field in South Georgia, an hour north of Tallahassee, Florida. And um, anyways, so I went up to the pulpit to give my eulogy, and I started off by saying, the Dalai Lama says, never lose the lesson. And, and I went on, and the whole church was quiet. And anyways, when I finished, somebody, uh, a gentleman came up, and he actually had gone to high school with my late father. And he came up to me, and he goes, in all my life, I never thought I'd hear the Dalai Lama quoted in Meg's Baptist Church. He goes, you had those women rolling. So um, anyways. But I, I do believe that, you know, everything has a, a lesson. And so what I thought would might be the most beneficial thing for me to talk about today is maybe some of those lessons that I've learned along the way. Because maybe it'll help you from creating some of those mistakes. Because we're all basically here to build our business, build ourselves. And um, it's really funny. Like, I feel so awkward right now because I'm in my hometown with people that are in my community, but my business has grown in a way that I'm never really here. Um, and so it's very funny, like people in Broward County and in South Florida remember me from when I was in the headlines with launching bluesuitmom.com. So most people when I'm in South Florida and they haven't seen me for a while or I'm in a, some event or something, they'll go, oh, so how's that little website going that you created? You know, and I'm like, well, it's doing just fine. It's about this much of my business, but it's doing great, you know. And then when I'm, you know, then I have all my friends that are outside of Florida, and they know what I'm doing, but they don't know where I came from. So it's kind of interesting. Like, I have a kind of, like, two lives here that are colliding at this conference. And so I'm going to give you a little bit of history and tell you where I picked up those lessons. And, um, and hopefully, you know, as a speaker, I always just want people in my audience to take one nugget of information away from my speech and apply it to their life. Clearly, the ladies over here did that yesterday, but um, so now I'm afraid of what I'm going to say and how it's going to be applied to their videos tonight. But, um, but anyways, so let me just get started here. Um, many of you guys probably, oh, and by the way, here's what you probably don't know about me. Um, and the reason I'm looking at my watch before I start speaking is I actually never took a business, business or marketing class in my entire life. Okay. Um, I 
am a biologist and a chemist by education. Yep. I, um, I have a degree in biology and I minored in chemistry. Um, and my dad, my dad said to me when I graduated, what the hell are you going to do with this now? And, um, and to this day, he says to me, why the hell are you on an airplane all the time? And so I finally um, invited him to hear me speak one time at a conference in Miami Beach, and he left going, oh, my God, that's what you do for a living? And um, anyhow, um, so, so I've never taken a biology, I mean, a, a business class or a marketing class, but the way I think about marketing, and somebody said this to me one time, they're like, you think about marketing so differently. And, of course, being a biologist, I started analyzing that. And, and what I realized was I think about marketing and people and consumers like a chemist, like if I were in a lab, right? Chemical A plus B gives me C, okay? So if I know that all of my consumers or my audience are doing A, and I want to get C out of them, I just have to add B. And I just have to figure out what B is and then add to it. And that's kind of what 30 Second um, Mom is doing. You know, she knows that moms are on the mobile. She knows she wants to build a company that gets to moms, so she added B to the formula, right? And you can do that to your own company. But um, so anyway, so the reason I was looking at my watch is whenever I talk, I know that biologically, my audience can only listen to me for 50 minutes because after 50 minutes, your synaptic vessels will no longer transmit across the neurons and you will disconnect, okay? So you should, first lesson, you should never speak beyond 50 minutes. That's why classes are only 50 minutes because biologically, you cannot process the information at full throttle, okay? So I will not speak beyond 50 minutes. And I never do. Um, I used to, when I was single, I used to explain to men in bars why women pee after drinking beer. And then, and then I would wonder why I never got picked up. In retrospect, it was really stupid. Like, why I was talking about oxytocin in a bar? I don't know. Anyways, so... Um, I don't know if, how many people know this, but I had three babies in less than 20 months, okay? And none of them are twins. And um, most people, like, start going, okay, how is that biologically possible? Um, I got pregnant and adopted at the same time. And uh, um, I was very blessed because, and don't ever say this to someone who tells you that, that happens to everyone. It only happens to 3% of all adoptive parents. But think about it. Who's going to walk up to you and go, I adopted and I never got pregnant? No one's going to say that to you, right? So you only hear about the good ones like me. So I was one of the special 3% that, that got pregnant. I actually um, met my birth mother. I took her to Walt Disney World because I figured that was the happiest place on earth and she would like me. And... Um, and that was like on a Sunday. Um, that Thursday, she called me and said that um, one of her teenage friends had told her to, um, that she could get a lot of food stamps and federal aid if she kept the baby. So she decided to change her mind. And on, um, that was a Friday. On, um, so I spent all day Saturday, Sunday on the couch crying my eyes out. And because um, we were supposed to get this, it was July and I was supposed to get a baby in um, September. And um, on Monday morning, I had to, like, just go get my final blood work done from the last procedure that I had had trying to get pregnant, and I was pregnant Monday morning. And on Tuesday, my adoption attorney called me back and said, hey, guess what? We have a new baby for you that's going to be born the same week as the first one. And I my, looked at my husband, and I go, okay, well, this is just what God meant, and we're going for it. So we didn't tell any of my parents that the first baby had fallen through, and um, or any of our friends, and um, I got to be in the delivery room um, while I was four and a half months pregnant with uh, my birth mother, who saw like who was diabetic, got to the hospital too late for any kind of drugs, and I was watching this. I was like, no way am I doing that. Okay, 
the, like I saw that, ep, you know, the episiotomy, and I was like, no, 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 no. Anyhow, um, she never knew at the time that I was pregnant because I just had a fear she would change her mind if, if she knew that I was already pregnant. And, and it was just the most beautiful thing. Um, and so anyways, four and a half months later, Oh, well, actually, the next day, I called my gynecologist, who was my best friend, because when you go to the gynecologist 300 times in one year, she's your best friend, right? And, um, you know, I'd be up on the thing with my legs up. Hey, where do you want to go to lunch today? Oh, I don't know. Let's go get a burger, you know? Anyways, um, so, um, so I called her, and I'm like, Martha schedule the c-section there's no way i'm doing that so anyhow um so i had three baby and then and then i so i had gave birth to owen um and it was really funny because i was walking around nine months pregnant i was at mommy and me nine months pregnant and with a you know six month old in my arms and and people little old ladies would stop me in the mall and they go how did that happen and like it <laughs> So often people ask me that, that finally my girlfriend one day looked at this lady and goes, two different men. <laughs> and and um, these little ladies were like, uh, anyhow. So, um, so if I ever had to advocate for something, it would be that um, insurance companies are extremely unfair and you know that they're run by men because they will fund Viagra. But if a woman's ovaries do not work, they will not fund your infertility drugs, okay? And that is so not right, okay? Because my ovaries did not work. If my liver didn't work, they would pay for my drugs, right? But my ovary, that was elective, okay? Um, well, you know what? Getting a hard penis is elective in my book, okay? Jeez. Yeah. I'm sorry, Mr. Seaborn. Uh, anyways. <laughs> it's selective, right? And in my husband's mind, it's not elective enough in mine. Um, anyways. Um, so my young business partner, Dan's back there going, oh my God, I took her on as a business partner. <laughs> um, Anyhow, um, so I would really, but, but I had paid out my deductible by March when I had my baby, I had the second baby. So I went back to my gynecologist and I'm like, hey, Martha, can I just have like one rotation of drugs before my deductible calendar year's over? And she's like, yeah. And I'm like, but I can't come in for insemination, you know? She's like, well, you're just going to have to do it on your own, you know, because we are going on vacation. Anyways, I should have named Keenan Canyon. Um, as in grand. Uh, I'm like watching the sunset over the Grand Canyon. I'm like, hurry, honey, I need my Pergonol. It's six o'clock. Come behind the car. Just give it to me. Um, anyway, because you have to have your shot at the exact same time every day if you've been through. Yeah, right? You know. The canyon? Yeah, I know where you were. <laughs> Okay, so anyways, um, I'm really getting to my business tips. So, so um, and I only have 40 minutes left. So, anyhow, so, um, so it happened, like, the first time. It actually worked, and, um, and so I ended up with a 20-month-old, a 15-month-old, and a newborn, okay? And, um... And at the time, I, if you live in South Florida, you know the name Wayne Heisinger. He owns the Dolphins. He started Blockbuster. I worked for Wayne Heisinger, okay? And um, he was going to start this car company called Auto Nation. And I had the opportunity to, um, to go to work for him. And I was only the second female executive at Auto Nation when he started Auto Nation with three babies under 20 months at home, okay? Um, and the reason I got the job, this is funny, the reason I got the job was because I, I'm not a big drinker, except for every now and then I have a blue drink, but um, I had basically been pregnant for two years, right? And so my first night out, I get invited over to his house, it was like at a fundraiser or something, 
and I decide that I was going to have a glass of wine, right? Well, I also, after that glass of wine, apparently felt so good that I decided to tell him, he, at the time he owned um, Blockbuster Video and Discovery Zone. Remember the dirty balls and all that? You know, kids' green stuff coming out of their nose on the balls? Anyways, I decided to tell him how I could fix Discovery Zone, okay? After one glass of wine. And then I also told him that when he sat, actually I told the president of the company, Steve Berard, that when he sat in the founder seats at the Marlins game, that he should really wear dark socks rather than white ones because everybody on TV could see his white socks when his leg went up. Well, Steve decided that I had a lot of cojones and he wanted me on his team. And actually he said to me, there is no one that can BS better than me, so I want you the, the, other than you, and I want you next to me. And he made me a promise at the corner of Broward Boulevard at a red light. He said, if you come to work with me, I will teach you how to build a company. Now, when a guy who built waste management and Blockbuster tells you, work with me, and I will teach you how to build a company, okay, that's better than Harvard Business School, okay? And I said, okay, well, what am I doing? I really don't want to work in marketing. And he goes, I don't know what you're doing, but I know you're smart, and you're going to sit in my office, and you're going to help me build this company. And so I helped work on the acquisition of Alamo Rental Car and John Elway's car dealerships, and I commuted back, and I flew over 100,000 miles with three kids under two at home, okay? So my kids actually have known me as a traveling mom since they were very little. And actually... Um, I never focused on what I was missing. I always focused on what I was giving my children, the lessons that I was teaching them when they watched what I do, did. And, you know, I did things like I had a big map in the hallway, and we would look at the map, and we would put a star where Mommy was flying this week and, and all of that. But I think the greatest lesson I gave them was that I loved my job. I loved work. I loved creativity, whatever. So um, anyways, I worked at AutoNation, and, um, and I learned from Steve Berard, okay? Um, I, I took a lesson from every, unfortunately, I've only worked for powerful men. From, for every powerful man that I, they, that I worked with, I took one lesson. So from Steve Berard and Wayne Heisinger, what I learned was, Women and most people fall in love with their businesses, okay? We don't have an exit plan. We don't have an exit strategy. I will bet you a hundred bucks, and I'm not going to put Elisa on the, on the um, block on this one, but I guarantee you she's got an exit strategy to sell her company to a mobile company, okay? She's no fool. She did it once. She's going to do it again, okay? How many of you have even we um one of the other guys that i used to work for used to say we call it a napkin um business plan because at a cocktail party you would just write your business plan and that's all you need on a cocktail napkin how many of you have a business plan for your business oh good okay that's more than than normal most women fall in love with their businesses and we don't have an exit plan I know exactly what my exit plan is. And I remind myself of that quite often. And um, so, so that was a lesson that I took from, from him. Prior to working um, uh, for AutoNation, I actually started my career with, um, with the Miami Herald. And um, I worked for the publisher, a wonderful guy named Chris Mobley. And while I was there, I started what is what became the largest parenting conference in South Florida called South Florida Parenting Conference. And um, what he taught me was the power of a handwritten note. In this day and age, I still write handwritten notes. You know why? Because it sets you apart. Do you know how I built my business initially? I used to take the Sunday paper to the beach every Sunday, and I would go and I would take the New York Times, okay, I would read the wedding section. And anybody that was getting married that remotely had a job or a connection in a company that I wanted to have a connection with, I would cut it out 
because what woman does not want an extra copy of her wedding announcement, okay? I would cut it out. I would write a handwritten note and just say, hey, saw this in the paper, thought, I would, I thought you would like an extra copy, and I would insert my business card. So if she was the sales coordinator at Nickelodeon or she was the advertising executive at whatever, she got a handwritten note from me with my business card and her wedding announcement, okay? It set me apart. Now, I probably sent out thousands of them and only got five or six clients out of it, but you know what? It was all relationship building. And that handwritten note in a day and age where people don't even remember to say thank you or think it's okay to post a, you know, something on someone's Facebook page to say thank you, a handwritten note is something that sets you apart. So that was another lesson that I, that I learned and I um, continue to, um, to use today. Then, um, so after AutoNation, you know, I did my radio show, uh, so I left AutoNation because when you work for an entrepreneur, you become an entrepreneur. And um, uh, we, a whole group of executives, we all left at once, myself and 10 guys. And um, it was really interesting. When I was at AutoNation, being one of only one, no, there was two female vice presidents. And um, we all had, we both had kids and I was in her corner office. She was vice president of public relations and I was vice president of administration and um, loyalty marketing. And, um, and all of our kids at AutoNation went to a little private preschool called Happy Land um, that was right down the street. And um, it was time for the Christmas, parade, uh, Christmas play at school and I went outside to the assistants that all were outside of my office. I was like on the 21st floor overlooking the beach with this beautiful office. And um, all the guys were out there and they were telling their assistants that they, they were saying things like this. Oh my God, I gotta leave. My wife is dragging me to the school play today, right? I came out of my office and like that was acceptable because the wife was making you go to the school play and you were going to have to leave the office in the middle of the day. Me, I walk out of the office and I said, I have an out of the office meeting. I'll be back in an hour. Okay. We all ended up in the same place, but I felt like I couldn't say that I was leaving for my children because the perception would be that I was leaving for my children. But the guys could say it was okay that, the wife was dragging them out. So um, anyways, it was at that moment that Leslie and I, Leslie Mundy, she was the other vice president, we started having conversations about what it was like to, at that time women wore blue suits, you guys, um, in corporate America, um, what it was like to be a corporate mom and how our challenges were a little bit different than let's say a woman who might have been a bank teller or had some more flexibility in her career. You know, we were dealing with our husband's egos and stock options and these men that it was okay to play golf, but you know, I couldn't leave to go to the school play. And so, um, so when I left, that's when the thought of blue suit mom came into my head and helping other executive working mothers with the challenges that I had. But very quickly after that, my company was acquired by a gentleman named Michael Egan. Now Michael Egan saw what I was doing um, and the following of women that I had, and he was a very smart man. He started Alamo Rental Car, and um, he had lunch. With, I, I had lunch with him one day, and um, I said to him, you know, I was telling him what I was doing and stuff, and he gave me one of the best pieces of advice that I have to this day continued with me to use. He said, Maria, how many hours are there a day? I said, 24. Okay, so you've built your business on consulting hours. So today you can tell me exactly how much money you're gonna make next year. And I'm like, no, no, I started my business so I can make more, you know? He goes, you can't make more because as long as you build your business on you and the number of hours that you can sell in a day, you will always make the same, about the same amount of money because you're not making money when you sleep. And he was right. 
unless you have a product or a way to sell something other than the actual hours that you can put into your business, you will always make the same amount of money. You will never grow your business any larger. So very quickly, right after that conversation, I thought, oh my gosh, I speak to 11 million moms a month. I need a product line. I need something that they can buy when I'm sleeping. And so, um, so that was a lesson that I learned from Michael Egan. And, and soon after that, um, you know, God speaks to you in mysterious ways. I was in mass with my, um, one of my kids, and we're in the middle aisle, and he looks up at me, and I don't know, Kenan, it was Kenan, and he um, was, um, I don't know, like four or five, and he, he goes, Mom, i got to throw up. Well, we're right about the time of the Eucharist, the bell's going off, the priest is up there. i got little old ladies on both sides of me, and I'm like, oh, damn. And so I grab my... I grabbed my coach bag, which I had saved a lot of money for, and, and I looked at him, and I looked at the coach bag, and I'm like, no. And I put down the coach bag, and I let him throw up all over the floor, right? And um, a couple days later, I, um, and I still have that coach bag. If you think I, you know, I guess I'm, I keep things, because the other day, if you didn't see, I wore the outfit I wore on my first date with my husband 20 years ago, 22 years ago, I put it on and put it on Facebook. People were like, why do you own an outfit for 22 years? <laughs> well, I've owned a purse for 12, 12 years too, I guess. Anyways, um, so a couple days later, I was on a plane and I was looking at the air sickness bag and thinking, hey, gum, if I had had that in mass, in my purse, I could have whipped it out. And then I started looking at the bag and I'm like, it's waterproof, all those half-eaten peanut butter and jelly sandwiches or wet clothes or whatever. So we came up with the idea of the Smart Mom Sack. And it's part of the Smart Mom Solution line of products that I sell through various catalogs and online. So I really can sell a product um, while I'm sleeping. Um, okay, so as you can imagine, there was a lot of challenge in my life finding work-life balance. And somewhere along the way, I met a gentleman and he was really, really smart, and quite honestly, I don't even remember his name. Um, I know that one of my friends married his son, um, but I can't. Oh, Welch, Welch, okay. Um, that was his last name. Anyways, but he was really smart, and um, I, he was talking to me about, um, I, I remember I was like, God, you know, things are so crazy. And he goes, how, you know, how is it with the kids? And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm always flying and working, and, and my husband doesn't fold the towels right. And so I always have to go home and I'm like refolding the towels every time I go into the bathroom, you know, because he doesn't fold the towels right. And he looked at me as like, you're worried about how the towels are folded? And he said something very smart. He goes, you know, it's harder to be a good mom than it is a good housekeeper. And, you know, I wonder how many of us, and I realized that when I was in my house with my kids, I was more worried about like the fact that the towels were folded right than the, um, the time I was spending with my children. And, um, and he went into this description of priorities versus values. And how, he said, what are your priorities? And I'm like, spending time with my children. No, or what, are your, what are your values? And I said, spending time with my children. Um, I want to spend time with my husband. I want to go running because I love, I mean, I think it's important to take care of myself first because then I'm a better mom. And he said, okay, tell me what your to-do list is today. And it was, you know, clean out the garage, uh, get the Christmas presents wrapped. It was like things like that. And he said, okay, so the things that, that motivate you inside, the things you really value are these things. And there's not one thing on your to-do list today that is aligned with your value. He said, no wonder you're out of balance. Like, when your values and your priorities, your to-do list, are not aligned, that's when you feel like you don't have it together. And it was so true. And don't think, though, that you're always going to have that alignment. There's moments where you're going to go out of alignment. But if you know that it's like, just a journey where you're going to go in and out of balance, then it's okay. 
And then the other thing that I actually learned along the way through Blue Suit Mom was so many people used to ask me, oh my God, how do you do it? How do you do it? You're always on the go. How do you do it? I want to do it like you do. You know what? You can't do it like me because you don't have the same value. Your, you might really value, and I say this to people, define balance for yourself because and I always challenge when I'm giving this lecture in a corporate environment for people, I always give them crayons and I ask them to draw themselves when they're in balance. And um, your balance might be just going to the bathroom with the door shut. You know, I, I know at some part of my life, that's what it was. Um, your balance might be just to exercise an hour every day. If I do not run, I guarantee you, the women in my office can tell you, oh my God, Maria did not exercise today. She is bouncing off the walls. Um, some women just want a manicure. Well, you know what? I didn't get my first manicure until I was 40 years old. Okay, so, so the fact that my nails are do not done doesn't bother me, but it bothers some women. So you have to define it by yourself and you have to do it according to your values and don't let anyone else tell you how to find balance in your life. You gotta do it according to your values and your priorities, okay? Okay, um, Maxine Clark, she taught me a lesson. One night we were, um, as many of you guys know, she's one of my dear friends. <laughs> she's so fun to hang out with. She, um, she and I were sitting on our, in pajamas and we were in North Carolina like, at some kind of trade show and we were in the weirdest house we had to rent. People collected Happy Meal toys and like they were all over like you're sleeping and there was Happy Meal toys all over the wall. It was so weird. Anyways, um, but we were sitting there watching baseball like around midnight one night and she goes, you know Maria, I love helping women with their businesses and we were talking about these young women that had ideas and whatever and she said, you know the funny thing is though, you know, I'll email someone and I'll say, gosh, you know, I really want to help you. Tell me about your business. And, the, and she goes, I'll get an email back that says, I'm sorry, I need you to sign an NDA and I really can't tell you because I'm afraid someone might steal the idea. And, and I'm telling you, I have the same conversations with young women who are starting companies. We wind up, truthfully, there is no original idea, okay? except for the idea of a Twitter party, which I will always coin Amy. Amy invented the Twitter party, okay? Um, but anyways, um, there is no original idea. And if you aren't, are afraid of sharing your ideas, particularly with someone like Maxine Clark that could give you really good business advice, you're probably never, you, you really actually have a fear of being successful. And I find that a lot of women have a fear of being successful. For whatever reason it is, we fear success. So what we do is we put barriers in our own way because for whatever reason, we don't feel like we're worthy of it. We don't feel that we deserve the value of being successful and we fear success. So from Maxine, I just take away that lesson of don't be afraid to share your ideas. Have people stolen my ideas in the last 12 years? Heck yeah. That's why there's a mom out there that has a business that's exactly like mine. And the last time I spoke to her 15 years ago, I still on my laptop have a letter that we sent to businesses together that we had a mom marketing company, okay? 15 years ago, it's still on my laptop. That was the last day I ever talked to her because she stopped answering my emails and my phone calls and next thing I know, she has a business just like mine. That's why I own Mom, Mom Talk and she owns Mother Talk. You know, so <laughs> somebody once said, you, don't, you need a clone for your business. And I'm like, I have one, believe me. <laughs> believe me, every time I put up a new media kit, it's there on her site. So you are gonna have people that steal your ideas and you're gonna have people that there are just some people that have no pride in life, okay? But for every five steps you, you know, that you move ahead, that there's always gonna be one back every now and then because that's just the way business is. But don't be afraid to, to share. Um, so anybody that knows me knows that I love fishing, okay? 
I work so I can fish. Okay, just go to my Facebook page and you will see. Um, I learned this out in a boat in the middle of the St. John's River with a guy named Sammy Anastasi, who is a contractor. Um, and we're out there fishing for um, bass at the croaker hole and with eels. And we're talking about our businesses and such, and I'm telling them how great it's going, and I'm doing a lot of international business now, and you know, we're up to 15 people in my office, blah, blah, blah. And he says to me, he goes, are you making money or are you moving it around? How many of you guys are really making money? Have you ever done a time audit on the amount of time that you're putting into your business and what it's costing you to run your business? Are you making money or are you pushing it around? When you do that time audit, you might be surprised. Maybe you'll be pleasantly surprised and you're going to say, yeah, I'm making money. But I bet you that some of you are just pushing money around. And here's a tip that I gave the other day. When he said that, I realized I stink at asking for money. I stink at it. Listen, I grew up as a little Catholic girl who had to sell raffle tickets door to door in Ortega Forest in my hometown, and I hated asking for money. I was like, raffle tickets. Um, sorry, I have to ask for another dollar, okay? So what I found was I suck at asking for money. Someone asked me for a price, I'm like, oh, don't worry about it. I'll just do it, right? Because I hate asking for money. So you know what I did? I hired someone who wasn't afraid to ask for money. And so when someone asked me, what is the cost? Are you available to speak at our conference? What would your fee be? I say, you know what? Um, I'll check with Laura. I'll hook you up with Laura in my office. She's actually the one who also pays bills, so she knows how much money we need, right? And, um, and she will be more than happy to um, give you pricing for my services. I never speak money because it's not in my comfort zone. And if I spoke money, and you know what? Once I started putting that on someone else, guess what? I stopped moving money around. I started making money. Then I could buy my own day gum boat and go fishing by myself. Um, so anyways, um, I actually don't have a really nice boat. I have like a pontoon boat. It has a hole. If I go too fast in the river, the water comes up through the middle, but it's a pontoon boat, so it can't sink, okay? I've been looking for that hole for like three years and I can't find the freaking hole. Um, anyways, um, so, so think about whether you're making money or you're pushing it around, okay? Um, how many of you guys have a mission statement for your business, okay? How many of y'all have a mission statement for yourself, okay? Fewer people. I have a mission statement have a personal mission statement because a lot of times, particularly when you fall in love with your business, you need to know why you're doing it. So someone, I, and I, I, do, I used to do a lot of coaching for women in sales forces and, and um, somebody challenged me one time and they're like, well, what's your mission statement? And I was like, huh, that's a pretty good question. And I thought about everything I do Mom Talk Radio, BlueSuitMom.com, writing my books, um, whatever else I do, um, speaking at conferences. And I realized there was one common thread. I really did have a mission statement. It was all about empowering moms. My mission is about empowering moms. Believe me, I am not having this conference because I am making a dime off of it. In fact, I just, stopped, I just last month paid off last year's she streams. I do this because I am driven to empower moms and empower women. And that's my mission. Everything I do, whether it's empowering women by giving them, bringing experts to them via podcasting and my national radio show, uh, whether it was when I was the host of, of the Balancing Act on Lifetime, I was giving out information and empowering moms. It, every single thing I do is about empowering moms. So figure out what your personal mission statement is, and then you won't even have to read that book about pur purposeful life because you'll already know it. 
I mean, think about how many people go their entire life and they never know what their purpose is, right? So if you leave today with that, then, then you've saved yourself a lot of time. And then um, finally, um, this came from Eleanor Roosevelt, and we don't even share the same politics. But I love this quote, and it actually hangs on my, um, what's that board you made me create 10 years ago, Molly? Dream board, yeah. So <laughs> Molly made me, like, you, uh, yeah, I've updated it a few times. Um, um, Molly made me create a dream board way back in 1999 when I met her. Um, I'm like, okay, fine. Laura Motsid in my office, she's the one at the registration. <laughs> For like 10 years on her dream board, she had a picture of me and Oprah. I think that one's dead. Um, I don't think it's going to happen. I keep trying to tell her to take it down. Um, anyways. So on my dream board is a little quote from Eleanor Roosevelt, and it says, every day do one thing you fear. And what I fear as my business grows has changed over the last 12 years. When I first started my business, the reason I put the quote up there was, I hate cold calling, okay? I hate cold calling. I can't stand it. Thank God now you actually can just Facebook someone or go to LinkedIn, you know, so you don't even have to talk to them. So I guess it would be cold tagging or cold messaging, I don't know, but, but I hate that. And um, because you wouldn't believe this, I try to tell people this, I'm actually a very shy person, and I don't do well, like, one-on-one -on -one if I'm not really totally comfortable with you. Like, right now, my husband is running for judge, and I'm a politician's wife, and I'm like, I, like, sweat when I have to introduce myself to people I don't know. Um, but uh, anyway, so... So at first it was calling people. You know, so think about what is it that you put off every single day? Chances are you probably fear it or you fear the outcome of it. Um, and then also what I realized about that cold calling was that I always talked myself out of it. Like I always, like, I was like, oh, it's Friday at 2. She probably doesn't like phone calls at 2 o'clock on Friday afternoons. I'll just, I'll just call on Monday. And then Monday it was like, oh, nobody likes to get calls on Monday because they're starting their week, so I'll wait till Tuesday, you know, and then whatever. Um, but then I learned about something called objective reality, and that is that if um, Amy was going to make that same phone call that I had to make, she wouldn't, have, she wouldn't know the person, right? So she wouldn't... Um, she wouldn't attach any emotion to it. She would just say, well, that's Susie Q. I'll call her. In fact, I, I actually applied very early in my career objective reality to a phone call that I made that I had no idea who I was calling, and it really worked. I actually, somebody, I was just out of college. My, I was working on a fundraiser and, um, here in town, and I was 20 years old, and somebody said, we need an airplane for our fundraiser. And I'm like, well, where are we going to find that? Oh, well, somebody, can somebody call Wayne Heisinga and ask to borrow his airplane? I didn't know who Wayne Heisinga was. I was like, I think my parents know him. He lives across the, the river. I'll call him. So I called this guy named Wayne Heisinga to ask him to borrow his airplane, right? I figured he's my parents' friends, and then he'd take my call. Little did I know who I was calling, right? And um, anyways, one Friday afternoon, I'm getting ready for happy hour because that's what you did when you were single. And... Um, the phone rings and this lady goes, please hold for Mr. Heisinga. And I'm like, who the hell is this? He can't even pick up his own phone and dial? I literally, I said that to myself. And he got on and I'm like, yeah, Wayne, can I borrow your plane for this fundraiser? And he was really nice and he let me borrow his plane and he gave me all this champagne in it and whatever. And at the Miami Herald, I became known as the girl who borrowed Wayne Heisinga's plane. And, um, but when you don't know who you're talking to, you're, you know, you're not afraid of making that phone call. So think about applying, the next time you're talking yourself out of something, objective reality. What would the lady who didn't know or the person who didn't know the person I'm trying to contact think? They wouldn't think anything, right? They would just pick up the phone and make the phone call. Well, listen, I also believe that when you build a company, surround yourself with people that do things better than you, because that's the other thing. You gotta kind of admit that you're not good at everything. So, um, so now I hired Stacy. Stacy was like University of Florida Caller of the Year. 
that girl can call the president and she doesn't have a fear of it. I mean, so I know that I hate cold calling people. Well, I got Stacy now, so she does that. So surround yourself with the people that you need to fill in on the skill sets. And um, with that, like your synaptic vessels are going, nah, I don't know, she's pushing the limit here. So um, anyways, you guys have made another one of my dreams come true. I can take that off the dream board or else add to it. Um, with being here at Shame Streams, I'm happy to take a question if you want to ask me a question. Um, but if not, I just want to give you a big old thank you. So thank you. Um, anyone have a question? Melanie. Oh, here comes Stacy. She loves this job. She asked me if this is what it means to be a moderator. I go, uh, no, that would be the mic holder. Um, you mentioned that you, um, you know, you've had ideas stolen and everything, but how do you deal with that when you're going and beating yourself up like, damn, they took that away and I didn't work on it. That I call Amy you know, Bear. How do, you, how do you work on it? How do you get over it? I, I know, I know. I do. I, I call Amy Bear. <laughs> And then she, she'll text me back and go, I just vomited in my throat. That's what she says all the time. <laughs> I know. It's so good. Anyways, um, you know, I did learn a couple lessons. I always register URLs before I talk about anything. In fact, I even register URLs before I go to meetings with people. Um, that's why I own walmartmoms.com. Yes. And if they would like to pay me more than $250 that they offered, I might sell it to them. I'm like, are you kidding me? Really? And he goes, I'm giving you till Friday at five. That's our final offer. I'm like, oh, okay. Thank you. Um, and every variation of Walmart mothers, Walmart, mo anyways. So I, I have learned, Melanie, to try to protect myself as much as I can before I talk about it. You know, I'm a big believer in karma also. And, you know, I, I think that if I, I help other people, the help is going to come back to me. I think if I'm a good person, you know, I told Jen and I were talking about this yesterday, um, at the cocktail party, when I die, I just want people to say that I was a loyal person and that I was a good friend. And, you know, I realized a long time ago, I could get sucked into all that negative energy of the person who's stealing my ideas, but what does it do, do for me? Do you know what I mean? I mean, yeah, I go for a long run and I do, do text Amy <laughs> Bear a lot and just say this sucks, but but um, I try to protect myself up front. I, um, listen, if you ever, <clears throat> if you ever, I mean, I don't own Mom Talk. I owned the, the trademark for Mom Talk. But I let someone else get the URL, and now I, I spent thousands of dollars trying to protect my trademark. But trademark the names that, that of your business. You know, register the URLs of your children's names right now. You know, um, and, um, and try to just protect yourself as, as much as possible. Unfortunately, you know, and you know, let me tell you something. You bring up one other thing that I'd like to share, and that's partnerships. Because a lot of people who steal your ideas start off calling you by going, hey, let's be partners, okay? And literally, that's how this particular, that particular um, thing started. Let's be, there is not a person out there right now that owns a marketing to moms firm that has not either worked for me, been my partner, or been in one of my books. Every single one of them, okay? And um, anyways, so I learned this about partnerships. Particularly, if, I mean, clearly you guys are here because you're go-getters, okay? You took the time to stop your world and come to better yourself. That tells me you're a go-getter. And along the way, there's gonna be people who try to jump on your train. What I always do when I get that call that says, hey, let's be a partner, it's gonna be such good to collaborate. I always give the other person an assignment and see if they get it done. And if they get it done and they come back to me, I know that they're, they wanna be a serious partner. They're willing to give as much as I'm willing to give. And I'll give you an example. 
I'm sure many of you met Dan in the back of the room with Premama. Raise your hand, Dan. Great product. Premama is that the, the prenatal vitamin that you don't have to gag on. Anyways, two years ago, Dan and his partner called me and when they had the idea. This is Bailey. I said, call me Maria, just because you're the age of my son. <laughs> um, you know, we have this idea. You know, would you be willing to partner with us? Whatever, two years ago. And I did that. I gave them an assignment. They came back six months later. They came back the next six. I gave them another one six months later. And when he asked me to be a partner in his business after I had given him several assignments, I knew he was serious because not only did he give me legal papers to sign, which is always a really good thing, um, but he had proven himself, he and his partners, that he actually wanted to be a partner with me. And so when you get that call, don't just ask him, well, you know, I'll do this and you do this. Give them an assignment and see how much they're willing to put their elbow grease into your partnership before you just jump right into bed with them, okay? A little foreplay doesn't hurt, you know? Is that in the 10 things? No. <laughs> Anyways, um, so that, that's a, also a way to not get burned in the end. One more question, anybody else? Oh, yes ma'am? Come on, Stacy. <laughs> Good morning. I love your speaking, and I will attend a conference just to hear you speak. Oh, thanks. Thank you. I wish my kids would do that. <laughs> <laughs> but your first tip <laughs> scared me a little bit, which was um, loving our business uh -huh. and having an exit strategy. And I spent my life to get to this point, and I'm really excited. And now I'm supposed to be having an exit strategy, and I don't know why, because yeah, but I love what I'm doing. But that's okay, but, but we all transition in and out of our, what, the things that brought you, life experiences brought you to where you are right now with your business. You know, you survived cancer, you did this, you did that, right? So life experiences brought you to this point. Life experiences will change your business and change your desires and what you do. You know, I mentioned this yesterday in the Power Mom session. I'm watching a lot of bloggers as their children are, getting children are getting older, they're getting out of blogging. Well, now they got, I mean, Blue Suit Mom, we have 20,000 pages of content on bluesuitmom.com, okay? Where, well, you're on there, at least 5,000 of them. Um, you know, I, I got to have an exit strategy for that. I mean, one day I can't create bluesuitgrandma.com. I guess I could, but I don't want to, okay? So, you know, even though I know, um, I do have a few URLs already. I am a, they will tell you, I am a URL junkie, man. I own, what, 300 URLs? Um, too many. Anyways, um, but your, your visions will change. And even if it's just um, like a kind of pie in the sky, like when I created bluesuitmom.com, my exit strategy was to sell it to Working Mother Magazine, okay, because I thought it was a good fit. Well, guess what? Two years into Blue Suit Mom, I sat down with Carol Evans, and we, they didn't know how to create a website. And we sat down, we went through the business process, proposition, um, the publishing uh, industry was starting to tank and as you know working mother magazine has gone through several transitions and I didn't do that but I almost got to that exit strategy but what it did was it allowed me to see that hey there was a bigger exit strategy so then I started working with Meredith and ladies home journal and family circle and at, at one point family circle was the sponsor of my radio show and they were the only magazine that also had a mom's radio show it worked really well, and I continue to foster that relationship. So you need an exit strategy because you're not going to want to do what you're doing for the rest of your life. It's going to change with your life experiences. And you might build on that extra strategy, but you at least need to have one to know that, because if not, you're just going to make a rational decision sometimes because you're so in love with your business. So anyways, I'm around all day. Um, I'm around all night, be back at eight, no. 
Um, so um, I am going to take a 45 minute break from the conference because life is calling me. My daughter got turned down by her number one college last night and I haven't been able to talk to her and so she's going to meet me across the street for a few minutes. That's how you balance life and family, right? So, um, so anyways, um, thank you for being here. We're going to have breakout sessions now and then we have pizza samples for lunch, but it's not just we're serving other things besides pizza, okay? So if you're on Weight Watchers like me, don't worry, you can, don't have to count your points with the pizzas. But I love Prashada pizza because it has sea salt and olive oil and everything, including the vegetables, are fast, uh, like flash frozen. Um, so anyways, um, terrific breakout sessions. I hope you'll take advantage of them because I heard yesterday I, I, that a lot of moms who, I loved when Neary said to me up here, Maria, I never go to breakout sessions or to sessions at conferences, and I have literally been sitting through every single one, and that was the hugest compliment that I could get. So please enjoy and take away a lot today. So we'll take a break. <laughs>